it's you're very mm-hmm. critical of what you call i think the biochemical model um yeah. of uh, the sort of ways uh, our the biomedical work. model yeah the biomedical model um mm-hmm. and and you're sort of critical of the idea of like treating for example the body as if it were a machine or our brains as if they were computers um and yeah. as someone who i think i'm a bit more sympathetic to those models but i'd like to hear you at least like lay out your sort of case where you think they're inadequate and what you think is maybe a bit better yeah so i mean part of it comes from what i was saying before mm-hmm. about this idea of, of of all illness and health really being mm-hmm. being this part of this kind of looping effect where our our expectations and beliefs kind of feed into our biology our mm-hmm. physiology and vice versa and um when you look at something like uh, like mental illness, yeah. we've really fo- focused on on the biological side of that loop and mm-hmm. t- trying to find these sort of magical chemicals that will make people feel better. Yeah. Whereas um, the other side of it has been, apart from cognitive behavioral therapy, kind of tries it does try to yeah. to address that side of it, but but the whole pharmaceutical side of it is purely based on the. the the physio- physiological side, mm-hmm. and we really, in 50 years, have not come up with any biomarkers for any mental illness or, or any test that you can take to see if you're depressed. Or I mean, the, the idea that serotonin causes depression is kind of on its way out. Yeah, and uh, and so you know we're back to kind of zero with that stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, I I think if you go back from that a little bit, I think what it goes what it goes back to is that this the mechanistic understanding of the body and mind is goes back goes back to kind of a, tr- this effort to try to get rid of dualism, which is yeah. you know the idea that there's a body and a mind and they're mm-hmm. separate and stuff. And um, but I think there's evidence that you know the Michael Gazzaniga talks a lot about mm-hmm. about this in his book um, of. Um, who's in charge yeah. um, about how you know the it's called strong emergence where mm-hmm. you know an emergence is where um, yeah. complex systems evolve from small sort of repeating yeah. actions and, uh, mm-hmm. and there's two ways to kind of understand that one is that um, like so an ant is, is just a simple thing yeah. You know, it can't really do very much, but when it reaches a certain critical mass of ants, they become like an intelligence and they can yeah. make a, a colony and they can move their eggs when mm-hmm. they need to and act as one sort of thing. And so if you think um, that a weak emergent understanding is the idea that you should be able to look at this ant and understand mm-hmm. how it becomes a colony. But a strong emergent understanding is that at some point, the complexity change, changes the rules by which the or is it, the thing is functioning. Yeah. And um, so you can't necessarily use the same rules to understand the ant that yeah. you use to understand the colony because they're obeying different mm-hmm. rules. Like the same way Gazzaniga talks about how you can't look at a car part and understand traffic. Yeah. Um, because you know it's just they're they're operating according to different yeah. rules and he applies the same theory to the brain and the mind and so the brain is like the parts the mm-hmm. small parts um and at some point it reaches a level of complexity where you can't reverse engineer it to the parts and so and that would be the self yeah. and the self then because it's past this what he calls a phase shift mm-hmm. um can up can can work backwards and change the system that it's part of. And we know that's true. You know, we know yeah. that meditation can change our gene expression and we can yeah. alter all our physical, um, you know, processes to a certain extent with our, you know, just by changing our ideas and our expectations. And that's, yeah. that's, I think the piece that is missing, you know, this, the idea that we're going to find all these things, uh, solutions to our, problems in, in, a, in just in pure physical form I don't yeah. think is is going to be sufficient ever because you have this this self and this idea of the self and um, you know I think that's a really important thing and you know how how solid your sense of self yeah. is affects your how your your physiology is functioning um, I think I mentioned in in that um, in the interview we did about how George Engel you know did this study of people who died suddenly, and yeah. um, and he looked at 170 cases, and um, 
they were things precipitated it like the loss of a spouse or a sibling or a friend or loss of a job or the demolition of a hotel where I worked for 30 years. And uh, one of his explanations was that all these people experienced like um, a loss of control or a sense that the person no longer has or no longer mm-hmm. believes that he has control over his situation or, yeah. or his, his self. And so when your self kind of disintegrates, that's when you start to get some of the negative effects we see with the nocebo effect. So. Yeah. So, I don't know, did I answer the question? You did. So, so I don't know, maybe yeah, maybe we're going to get buried in semantics and it might not be a super helpful direction to go into. Um, I yeah. think I'm inclined to like read this literature and I'm just really surprised and encouraged that I just think the, the sort of physical way our brains work is just a lot more complicated than I thought, we initially thought. Yeah. Um, so, like, of course you're not going to be yeah. able to just like mess around with serotonin levels and cure depression. Um, right. You know, like S- the SSRIs are... Um, like really helpful. I think it's a little bit of a mystery how helpful they are, but mm-hmm. like uh, on on average, they tend to be just as good as, for example, like kind of behavioral yeah. therapy. And but what the, that's doing is just question, changing. Yeah, so that's changing what CBT does is it just changes the way the brain works. Um, and of course, that's right. the sort of physical. So again, maybe yeah, we're maybe we're just as well or better than yeah. than if for for certain people as well or better than than pharmaceuticals. Yeah. And uh, the, but the question that's going to come up soon, I think, is that whether the amount that SSRIs worked was because of our belief in it, yeah. you know, and the, and, and there's this issue that, that, uh, the, they're, they're coming. Steve Silverman wrote a book of, or wrote an article about this and maybe a book also about how, um, over the last few years, plus drug, drug companies have had this trouble where, the drugs can't beat the placebo anymore. The, the placebo effect of yeah. antidepressants has gotten stronger, whereas they used to be able to to pass that, and and then that's deemed effective. Yeah. But now they're getting the same results, but the placebo effect is stronger, and so it's technically unaffected, even though. So why is the placebo effect in growing with antidepressants? And I think it's because of 20 years of inoculation with stories yeah. about how powerful antidepressants are that's kind of contributing to that. And so so those are the kind of things that the mechanistic, a purely mechanistic understanding of the body and mind can't really account yeah. for. You know, yeah. and I think a lot of these things are, are fluid processes in a way. Yeah. Um, there's not, then to think of them in kind of hard mechanistic terms, yeah. I think can can be counterproductive. Yeah. Well, so so let me quibble with that a little bit because so I took Introduction to Cognitive Science about like seven years ago. So I'm a little bit hazy on the details, okay. but I remember learning about Turing machines. Do you, do you are you familiar with what a Turing machine is? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the idea again, I'm probably gonna butcher this, but the idea is like there's kind of a tape and there's a machine that either say writes a one or a zero, and there are certain rules about how much the tape should move forward, how much the tape should move backwards. It has the ability to write numbers and has the ability to erase numbers for, and, and so on. And the idea is that any kind of computation that's possible, mm-hmm. you can, you know, in a very complicated, very ridiculous way, you can instantiate purely on this one little Turing machine with, the, you know, the right algorithms or whatever. So you can still get these sort of like recursive things. You can still get, you know, um, algorithms impacting the physical tape. Um, you can go back and rewrite things. Um, I don't think that's necessarily uh, incompatible with a purely mechanistic account. Again, what I think is the mistake here is suspecting that the mechanistic account's a lot more simpler than we're probably giving it credit for. So I think if, you know, I, I think yeah. in, there's there's been this reductive idea, which I think has been probably a little um, counterproductive, I agree, where basically we just, you know, once we started being able to do fMRI studies that were half-decent, we were just kind of like, yeah, screw psychology. You know, all we need to do is understand right. the brain and we're going to be fine. But I think, you know, a lot of interesting things happen on the psychological level, whether you want to call that strong emergence or not. Um, I think yeah, there, there are interesting yeah. ways to talk about this. But I do think, like, there's a strong case to be made for sort of distinctive, you know, specialized sciences. I think psychologists and neuroscientists are doing different things. I don't think that makes it less mechanistic or less physical. But again, I think we're just arguing semantics at yeah. this point. No, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there was a period where... Um where neuroscience was was considered going to kind of thought to be going to answer all our problems and explain everything and stuff. And I think we're sort of getting beyond that a little bit now. And, um, and biomedicine, by the way, is really powerful and, mm-hmm. and is really important. And I'm not saying it's not, yeah. you know, but it, it primarily came out of a, um, uh, infectious disease 
uh, model, you know, yeah. of, of from from developing antibiotics and vaccines, and yeah. and then and so that that you know is for those things it's good enough. It's yeah. more than good enough to you know even though there is a little bit of of mental side to that yeah. with your immune system and and those sorts of things, but um, but when you start to try to apply that then to mental illnesses or mm-hmm. other things or chronic pain or other yeah. things that are more complex and where yourself is a bigger presence in those things then, you know, it starts to fall apart a little bit.